Welcome to A Photographer's Life. The channel that takes you behind the curtain into the world of professional architectural photography. Join us now for an episode with one of America's premier architectural photographers. Today's broadcast comes from a recent interview with award-winning American architectural photographer Brad Fine Knopf. Today's interview was conducted by AIAP director Alan Blakely. We hope you enjoy the show. If you do, please let us know by liking this episode and subscribing to this channel. Now, on with the show. We now join Brad and Alan in conversation. You seem to be on most people's radar as far as architectural photography, so that's a good thing. I suppose, yeah. <laughs> I, I guess. Uh, are, you, are you in your studio or? I am. I am. Looks yeah. like you've got a psych wall. <laughs> yeah, okay. That looks, oh, that kind of stuff looks familiar to me. Yeah, this is, here, I can give you the, the three. Oh, okay. How nice. Wow, nice, nice space. Beautiful. Yeah, no, it's, we're very fortunate. Though, it's funny, um, aren't in here very much. <laughs> yeah. Um, my last studio, I, I built that in, in 08, which was really the, the very worst time I could build a studio. Um, it was my third studio and uh, my largest. And I used it basically for storage <laughs> because my business was, you know, had, had shifted to 90% architecture. Yeah. And so it basically was just an office for me and all the studio stuff that I had, I ended up selling at a garage sale when my lease expired and um, got completely out of that kind of business. But you know, that was my bread and butter for a lot of years. So, Yeah. You know, I, uh, out of college, I worked in New York city uh, as an assistant for a couple of years. And then I moved back to Columbus, which is my hometown. Mm -hmm. And it's just sort of like, for me, um, having a studio space has always been sort of like something I just need. That, I mean, that sounds kind of funny because so little I do in the studio, but mm -hmm. I've always wanted to have a physical space that I could go to. And I also, um, like COVID's obviously changed certain things, but, uh, you know, I also, wanted to create some separation of work and home. And mm -hmm. I went to my studio and work and then leave and leave my work behind. Uh, now, you know, uh, I'm working at the kitchen counter more often than not. And, uh, <laughs> but, and, and probably in a roundabout way, kind of working more uh, because I don't, you know, uh, my wife used to be, uh, you know, you're home now, <laughs> you know, kind of like, like, uh, and my laptop would stay at the studio and all those type of things. Yeah, so, I get mm -hmm. uh, you know, now I think, you know, she's kind of working at home and I'm kind of working at home. So, and our sons were working at home all through COVID to taking mm -hmm. the classes online. So yeah. it just sort of changed, changed things and changed the outlook. Um, I mean, the fortunate thing for me at this point in time is there's a um, food photographer who I became friendly with. And, and quite frankly, almost the whole time I've had the studio, I've had a food photographer who's uh, rented the studio probably five to 10 days a month. Okay. And, and even though that doesn't cover the mortgage, it certainly puts a dent in the mortgage. Absolutely. So I, I look at the studio in, in two, uh, two factors. One is, uh, I mean, we do do some portraiture and I like to have it for that purpose. Oh, yeah. uh, I like to have it as a workspace, but long-term, um, you know, we'll have this mortgage paid off in a handful of years and, and I'll have an asset, you know, it's yeah. sort of like you, you have to look at, you know, what kind of assets are you creating for yourself? And this is one of them. And, uh, you know, 
the stock market obviously is one thing, but property is not a bad asset. And this is in downtown Columbus. So um, yeah. hopefully, you know, at some point in time, if I choose to sell it, you know, it, it'll, it'll be a nice little yeah. nest egg, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that's very wise. Um, you know, that, that's kind of an interesting avenue because the people that contact me that want to know about this industry, one of the biggest surprises to them is that everybody's self-employed. <laughs> you know, um, Hedrick blessing kinds of opportunities are not out there anymore. And uh, so you have to kind of think of, of yourself and, and a strategy. How am I going to retire someday? And what's going to fund that retirement and all those kinds of things. And th do you have employees, you know, that are yes. salary or hourly? Okay. Yeah. Um, no, I, I mean, in fact, I, I don't, I'm obviously still in the process of, of that happening, but I'm kind of in a roundabout way like to emulate Hedrick blessing and, in a way. Mm -hmm. um, Lauren Davis, who's my associate, she was my assistant for five years. She's now and uh, shooting for me for six. Um, and she's, she's very talented. Um, and, uh, you know, I, and I think that, and I, before Lauren, I had another associate, Jason Meyer. Okay. For me, uh, unfortunately, Jason uh, didn't survive the downturn in 2007, 2008. Yeah. Uh, I mean, 2007, 2008 was hard. Uh, well, it was hard on a lot of, I mean, I managed to survive. Um, I don't know whether you've read Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Outliers. I have. Uh, but like, I, I think I reflect upon that all the time. And, and I mean, he talks about all different people, everybody from the Beatles to Carnegie to, and, and, and how they managed to be successful. And part of it was timing and part of it was, you know, the 10,000 hours type of thing. And I, I like think about that and I think about like my timing and, mm -hmm. and things that uh, that I'm still here now when, uh, you know, I could just as easily have gone by the wayside as so many other photographers. Um, and, and I would say that, uh, you know, in, in starting my career, you know, the internet came, I mean, it wasn't the internet when I started my career, and I, but I think the internet allowed me to reach a greater audience. For sure, yeah. And, and I think that was a blessing and helped me grow the business. And then when the downturn happened in 2000, 2008, my reputation had grown beyond just a local photographer right. to a regional photographer. And so I was, I, was, I was drawing on a lot more people than had I been a local photographer. And, and the people who went by the wayside were the people who only had those local uh, resources to draw upon. And that was my associate back then. Yeah. So, I mean, and he was a very talented photographer, uh, but just couldn't make it through that pandemic of sorts. Oh, and, sure. yeah. and then I think this pandemic's been also interesting in that you have the people getting into the industry who I don't think have made it. Mm -hmm. And you also have the people who, you know, I would say a lot of the people who were, I don't want to say my contemporaries, but people who I compete with more often than not are, you know, people who've been in the industry for, you know, 25, 30 years, right. are in their late 50s, early 60s. And a lot of them in their early 60s have said, you know, I'm a year or two years from retirement. Uh, I'm just going to call it now. So I think now's an interesting time because um, 
architects have hypothetically more work that they need to do because they've got to get caught up. Yeah. yeah. But I also think there's less providers out there. I mean, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so just kind of take us back there. What, what year did you, you know, get into photography professionally Would, where, and how did that start? Well, it actually started in a, in a roundabout way. Um, my father and grandfather were both architects. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I really thought from an early age, I was going to be an architect. Mm -hmm. um, I went to Cornell. Uh, my undergraduate degree is actually in facility planning and management and uh, felt that that would be a good lead into architecture and graduate school. Um, and my junior year at Cornell, I had a bunch of uh, friends who were all photo majors. Oh, okay. And they convinced me to take a photo course. And, and quite frankly, in high school, I had absolutely no interest in <laughs> photography. Uh, the, the kids who did photography for the school paper and stuff were, you know, kids with uh, parents with deep wallets who could buy them uh, an eight... 800 millimeter lens to go take to the football game. Yeah. And um, I was not really, and in, in, in to this day, I'm not very interested in uh, covering events. In fact, that, that's, that's one of the, the funny things in the family is that, you know, it's sort of like we'll have some big family gathering and everybody will look to me and... <laughs> So, well, how come you're not taking pictures? And I'm kind of like, well, I, I didn't realize that this was a, a paying gig. You know, it's sort of like I either have my I'm going to be present or I'm going to be working this gig. <laughs> and, exactly. Yeah. And I'm at, I'm, he had actually been a uh, architectural photographer in Cleveland. He had gone to Ohio University, uh -huh. uh, got his master's at Ohio University had been architectural photographer, ended up becoming the um, the dean of the fine arts school at Cornell. Okay. Uh, but uh, he was very much out of the minor white school of thought. Mm. And, and basically by, you know, looking and seeing the world around you, you get a greater sense of your being. And, um, and I, I just, the ability to slow down and appreciate things around you was what drew me to photography. And then um, after, so I would say that was the spring semester of my junior year. My senior year, I took every photo course I could get my hands oh, really? on. Uh, I took large format photography. I took non-silver processes. I took photo 102. Uh, you know, I took... To, to the extent that I had been a pretty good uh, design major at Cornell and my uh, advisor was totally ticked off at me. I mean, <laughs> by, by, by the second semester of my senior year, like I handed him my, my syllabus or my schedule and he, uh, he signed it and handed it back to me without even looking up from his desk because <laughs> Uh, he really felt that I was on a good path and, and now I'm going down this stupid photography path. And, but, you know, he wasn't going to argue with me about it. And, uh, but, uh, so I took all these photo courses. Uh, I mean, the interesting thing is at uh, that point in time, uh, John Zarkowski, who was the uh, curator of the Museum of Modern Art, was uh, a, what is it, uh, a visiting lecturer at Cornell. So I, I had John Zarkowski coming to our uh, photo 102 course uh, uh, telling us how crappy our photos were. <laughs> Actually, he liked one of my photos. He, he said, this is really good. Tell me what it's about. And I told him what I thought I, it was about. And John Zarkowski goes, it's a good photo, but that's not what it's about. <laughs> so, not, nothing like John Zarkowski uh, tearing a new one. Uh, <laughs> oh, man. Uh, 
Yeah. It's a rough start. Uh, <laughs> but then after... <laughs> Uh, but after Cornell, I moved to New York City. Uh, I moved to New York City because um, I'd only been taking photos for about a year and a half. Oh, okay. Um, I, I didn't feel I, I certainly wasn't ready for graduate school. Um, I wasn't ready to open a studio. So it was sort of like, how do I educate myself further? Yeah. And I moved to New York because I wanted to work with the best people I could get my hands on. Mm -hmm. And I was very fortunate. My first job out of uh, Cornell was working for Richard Avedon. Oh, wow. And we were on the covers of Vogue and GQ and Self yeah. Magazine. And um, it, was, it was the best and worst experience of my life. <laughs> in the, uh, <laughs> um, uh, working for Avedon, everything had to be perfect all the time. I mean, mm -hmm. when we shot the Revlon Most Unforgettable Women in the World campaign for, um, you know, we packaged up the package with the chrome, 8x10 chromes in it to go to Revlon. And, you know, when you, you cut the brown paper to size and all of the old should be at 45 degrees and the tape was taped to the end, you know, everything because it was, he believed in the kind of the Tiffany box. Oh, sure. Yeah. Presentation. Yeah. yeah. That, that, you know, when this uh, landed on Ron Perlman's desk at Revlon and he opened it up, there was this predisposition that what was in that package was something special and magical. Sure. And uh, so I, I worked for Avedon for about six months. And I would say that after working for Avedon, um, you know, once you had Avedon on your resume, every door opened up. I'm and sure. I worked for, uh, worked for Robert Maplethorpe before he died. I okay. worked for Horst. I worked for Arnold Newman and Joyce Tennyson. Um, it, it was really uh an incredible time of working with some pretty incredible people, but all quite frankly in the, either the fashion or the portraiture. Yeah. Industry. Yeah. Um, I, I really did not foresee that some roughly 30 years later, 30 plus years later that I'd be an architectural photographer. Um, at that point I uh, applied to graduate schools um, really wanted to go to Yale or RISD. Uh, I had also applied to NYU. Mm -hmm. I got into NYU, um, but I really, I, I had felt, I, I had kind of gotten burnt out on New York City. You mm -hmm. know, I, I'm a, still a Midwesterner <laughs> and, uh, and, and uh, you know, just New York's for the young and the wealthy. <laughs> and, and uh, and, and I just sort of had had my, my time in New York. And um, I, I did not get into Yale. I didn't get into RISD. They were accepting people who had been working on their thesis for 10 years. Oh, okay. And uh, they also, uh, you know, you, you go, you work for people like Avedon, Maplethorpe. You think those things are going to be great on your resume? Well, it's great on your resume as long as you're not applying to academia because <laughs> those are people who God forbid went into the commercial world and, and therefore they are, they're sinners, they're evil, they're, you know, and, and uh, I mean, you read the books on Avedon and, and, you know, he, he fought that his whole career. Oh, that, and, and, and we, we fight that still, don't you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're not taken seriously as, as artists, uh, because we've chosen to make a living at this, <laughs> making a good living at this. So, that's interesting. So uh, I ended up moving back to Columbus, Ohio. I uh, assisted a photographer photographer here locally uh, by the name of Jeff Rikus, uh, and he did all the work for Columbus Monthly Magazine, which was kind of and and I mean this is uh, nineteen eighty eight. Okay. 89. And in 88, 89, um, 
I would say most photographers across the country were jack of all trades. I mean, they were, you, yeah. You know, you, you were, somebody came in the door and they needed a portrait, you did a portrait. They needed a food shot, you did a food shot. You, you did a architectural shot. Um, it, it, there wasn't enough work in the local market to do any one thing. Right. And you didn't have the reach beyond the local market. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, for the most part. And um, so I worked for Jeff for three and a half years. And, uh, and then, uh, I mean, this is, <laughs> and I had a little segue into media in the early 1990s, uh, which nobody even knew what interactive multimedia was. So that never got <laughs> Um, now, now it's everywhere. I would just yeah. wait ahead of the curve. Um, and, and then, um, I, this sounds funny, but I was engaged and, uh, my father-in-law said, you've got to figure out what you're doing with your <laughs> life. <laughs> and, uh, I had a, a friend who, uh, or somebody who I'd become friends with who had, moved to Columbus, Ohio from New York City. He was basically a fashion photographer, fashion lifestyle oh. photographer. And he said, Brad, you are too good a photographer not to be in photography. And he brought me, he said, let's start a partnership, which we did. Hmm. And we were in a partnership for five and a half years. Uh, and it was the type of thing where, um, it was, we were able to start being specialists in the 19, early 1990s before a lot of people were. Mm -hmm. And that was because we were a studio where we would, we weren't turning around way any work. But if you came in and you had fashion, lifestyle, product work, Scott did it. If it was corporate, portrait, architecture, I did it. Okay. So... It, it was sort of the early onset of what I would call specialization. And, um, yeah. and you know, and it was also the type of thing, you need a fax machine. <laughs> we, <laughs> 50. I mean, it, it's silly things, but it is those type of things that you deal with when you're starting up a business and, yeah. and those type of things. Uh, Scott, unfortunately, um, was in an automobile accident, had to have... Uh, his ankle, had ankle surgery, a whole lot of things done with him, wow. uh, couldn't work for more than a year. And at a certain point, it was just time for us to mm. go se separate ways because I was, I had had my firstborn son and I was carrying the, the burden of the business and Scott was more interested in going back to France. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, he he had his priorities were other than keeping the business afloat and and therefore um and and i and that was probably about 96 and i've been on my own ever since and i would say in 96 probably i was doing 60 percent architecture and about 40 percent corporate and portraiture mm -hmm. and just as my reputation grew that grew to 70, 30, 80, 20, probably now about 95, five. Mm -hmm. you know, there's not a whole lot that I'm doing. Um, a, a little bit of portraiture here and there, but I, I think ultimately it goes back to my dad, uh, who, uh, you know, from probably as early as I could walk, maybe even before that, you know, I was going to job sites and looking at buildings <laughs> and, and getting to know architecture. And I, I will say that even, even today, that is my, one of my greater strengths is just the ability to have some basis in ar architecture, know architecture, be able to walk a project with an architect, understand the project, understand the thinking process, be able to, to talk uh, knowledgeably mm -hmm. about that architecture as opposed to just seeing it. I, I mean, I, going back to 
you know, the late eighties, early nineties, where, you know, somebody, not necessarily our studio, but, you know, you'd walk into any studio and go, Hey, I've got a building. Can you photograph a building? Sure. I can photograph a building. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, like, like, uh, uh, a building's the same as a piece of cheesecake or <laughs> anything else, you know? Um, and, and, you know, I, I think the more, the more you understand your history in architecture, you know, and photography. I mean, I, I will say I teach architectural photography at Columbus College of Art and Design every other year. And, and oh. you know, I, I will say that, you know, you got to know your past to know your future. And, and I, I think that's too many of, of the current generation, not entirely, but a lot of them are so wrapped up in the present <laughs> that the things that will make them grow into the future, they're not looking at. You know? I think I think those are yeah, two really important points. Um, that's one one thing I I think is is unique about architecture as a I mean architectural photography as a as a specialty is you've got to have some knowledge to inform your work. Uh, and and I, there's a level of comfort that an architect or an interior designer will have with you if you can talk intelligently with them oh, about sure. a project and, and understand the important points of that project and then rely on your eyes as an artist to you know create images that tell that story and showcase that architect or designer's work and and uh, uh, and, and then the history of, of photography seems to have gotten lost in the shuffle somewhere in the last 10, 15 years. I'm not sure what happened. No, and I, I well, it, it's funny because I have a huge photo library. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have a, a huge, I, I probably have between 150 to 200 architect or photography books. Mm -hmm. And my, my, the first one I ever bought was at Cornell, which was uh, this Ache ser series that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's funny. I think I bought them for $50 a piece and they're now worth like $500 a piece. Uh, <laughs> but I, I have all these photo books and, uh, you know, that I just remember a professor sort of saying your your library is your your resource and 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 even working with Avedon you know when Avedon was trying to get inspiration I mean the, the, I mean I know this sounds silly but it really isn't uh, when he was working on the Johnny Versace campaign mm -hmm. and looking for inspiration he was looking at the drawings of Michelangelo and Raphael looking at you know figure placement and how they were you know and and using that as inspiration for how he was gonna then pose models and whatever for Johnny Versace I mean you know I I think that's you know it, I'm always looking to grow I'm always looking to be better and I'm I am not so damn arrogant or naive <laughs> that I know it all. So, you know, it's like anything that can push me to be better. And when mm -hmm. looking at, you know, the work of Ezra Stoller or looking at, you know, people who aren't even in architecture, um, you know, the, <laughs> the yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I, I was fortunate enough. I was just, there at the TWA hotel and uh, okay, <laughs> it's, fabulous. it's fabulous. I mean, if you, I, in fact, we were flying out of LaGuardia. We weren't even flying out of JFK. Oh, okay. And, and we stayed at the TWA hotel. Wow. Just stay there. Yeah. So, just, that's yeah. so cool. Well, <laughs> you know, it, it I'm kind of concerned about some of the, the directions that the industry is taking just because, the newer people, newer photographers, those just don't have the vocabulary of, of 
the you know the history of photography, what's been done before in architectural photography, uh, or you know the vocabulary about architecture. Period. An understanding of you know the elements of architecture and, and design and and form and and the the things that you need to look for and you need to showcase when you are out there on an assignment. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. Um, who, who for, I mean, as far as architectural photography, well, I want to jump back to it. You had, I, I'm, you know, the people that you assisted in New York, that is an education that you could not have paid for. Um, oh, yeah. That That is huge. Uh, even though they didn't have, you know, work in an architectural photography uh, vein, just the fact that you got to see their working methods and their the way that they succeeded uh, with with clients on a daily basis, that's enormous, and that that's something that is not ever taught academically. Um, no, and and I'll say, you know, when I say about Avedon being the best worst. Uh, experience. I mean, you know, I, I would kid, but they're, they're not a whole lot of kidding to it. I never left that studio, meaning that, you know, from the moment I walked into the studio to the moment I left. And then when I left, I thought about, I mean, I dreamt about being in the studio. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I still, um, you know, one of my responsibilities, because I was the fourth assistant, so I was a little <laughs> uh, was that I was to pick up uh, croissants or danishes, uh, come to the studio, put out breakfast, uh, wipe off the, you know, um, uh, brush broom off the stoop. Um, and so when everybody, I got there about a half an hour before everybody else got there, so that when the first, second, third assistant showed up, there was breakfast laid out. And, uh, and one of the things that Avedon had was a great big glass orange juice pitcher. Oh. And I had this dream where I was walking from the refrigerator to the table with this orange juice pitcher and it slipped from my hands. <laughs> Battered, and I jumped out of bed. I mean, I literally found <laughs> at the end of my bed having this dream about. Um, but you know, there was no question at the Abaddon Studio that the uh, the zeal for perfection was there every moment of every day, um, and the tension level was this high. Yeah. But, but I think that, you know, I learned so much and that this is how, not that I want this tension level. I mean, I, I, I think I took the best elements out of that experience yeah. and put them forward. Um, and, but I, I did learn so very much from that, that singular experience. And then the other experiences that came from there. I mean, I, I no, I, I feel blessed beyond belief. I mean, if I look back at my lifetime between those experiences, the, the opportunities I've had professionally, um, I, I've really had a charmed career, life, whatever. Uh, yeah. So, and I, I feel incredibly blessed and fortunate. Yeah, I, I echo that. I feel the same way. I, um, my, my, you know, turning point for photography was, was, was several places along my career path. <laughs> um, eventually my, my wife convinced me that, uh, that that's what I needed to do. And so, you know, late eighties, that was, that was what I jumped into with both feet, but um, the, you you bring up something about just just the working methods of of doing excellent work and doing what it takes to do excellent work. It, you know, it's hard. It's it's really and it's difficult. I mean, for me still, this is hard work. 
when I when I shoot an assignment and I'm exhausted and my wife is is my stylist that works with me and so we're together all the time and she sees that I'm a different person when I'm shooting um, <laughs> because I just you, you have to be that focused to do to do good work and not just you know document the the building is not what you're there for uh, right. they're hiring you for your eyes and and the way that you're gonna see that that building um, you, just back to one thing you said too that we th this time period that you, both you and I came into this business in the late 80s. Um, um, that's when I got serious about this. And then to now, it's been a really interesting time period to have gone from, you know, I was shooting eight by 10 and four by five chromes and into this digital situation where, uh, you know, everything is um, equipment wise has changed. Mm -hmm. But um, tell me a little bit about that transition for you, and 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 was it was it a big deal, and and does it change? Did it change the way you shoot at all, or or you know, um, how, how was that transition for you? Uh, I think it's constantly evolving, um, and I also think you have to be open to evolving. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can't become complacent and you've got to be open to growing. Um, I shot four by five for 17 years. Um, I was a late adapter to digital, but I will say that, um, you know, back to my conversation about the outliers, I think I jumped at just the right time. Mm -hmm. You know, had I jumped sooner, um, I think I would have spent a lot more money on digital equipment that would have been obsolete very quickly. Yeah. Because, you know, some of the early digital cameras were like $10,000 and they were like for like, five megapixels, <laughs> you know, it, it was, uh, you well, know. It, yeah, it was, I, I jumped early myself and, you know, I I paid $8,000 for a 1.8 megapixel camera. <laughs> so, so, um, so I did not, you know, for, I, I'm trying to think how many years. Um, I mean, what we did is we bought a very good four by five scanner and yeah. we were scanning our four by fives and retouching them in post. Um, I had somebody who I had hired as an assistant who came to me one day and said, I would probably be a greater asset to you as a retoucher than as an assistant. Hmm. I, I will also say that um, I made a decision long ago uh, I, and I'll be the first one to say it, I am not a retoucher, not in, in any stretch of the imagination am I a retoucher. Okay. Uh, I wanted to spend my 40 hours a week, if not 50 or 60 hours a week, <laughs> uh, behind the camera. That's why I got into photography. And I wanted, and I sort of made the decision, I want to hire somebody who wants to spend 40 to 60 hours a week uh, in front of a computer doing retouching. And I want to be the best photographer I can be and let them be the best retoucher they can be. Uh, I saw, you know, when Photoshop came along, I saw a lot of local photographers um, go from spending the majority of their week taking pictures to the majority of their week doing Photoshop. Oh, sure. Yeah. And, and um and, and I know Photoshop is incredibly compelling and uh, wonderful, but that's not where I wanted to spend my time. Yeah. Um, and so I don't. Um, and, and uh, you know, that, that's a, a decision I made. But so we went from, from drum scanning, we then went to, um, I bought a medium format digital back 
because at that point in time, I felt that that was the most logical transition from four by five. I, mm -hmm. I didn't know that 35 millimeter was where I wanted to be. And uh, so we changed to uh, a phase one back and um, dropped about $75,000 on medium format digital equipment. Um, and I shot medium format for probably close to a good 10 years. Okay. Um, and then sort of came the point where, um, as you well know, you know, for a long time, architects did not really want people in their shots or it wasn't about people. And that has changed dramatically. <laughs> Um, and in fact, I mean, you were, you know, there are, are architects who, uh, who are hiring photographers who are almost not even architectural photographers anymore. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, you could even say that uh, in a, to a degree of uh, Iwin Bond uh, that you know, he's more of a sociological photographer yeah. and, and the building is important, but it's sort of secondary to the human experience. And, I, and intrinsically, I think that's a good thing. I mean, from son of an architect, grandson of an architect, I mean, we do design buildings for people and yeah. to uh, take these pristine shots of these buildings with no people in it is not, uh, you know, not reality. So, I mean, I do enjoy uh, photographing people and uh, having people in my shots. And, and as a result, that's when we kind of switch to, um, to 35 millimeter. And, yeah. and, and it was, you know, a we could auto bracket, and which I couldn't do with the medium format. Yeah. Uh, and I looked around, and whether it be, you know, all the photographers who I admire were all shooting thirty five millimeter. They weren't necessarily shooting medium format. Um, and it, it seemed like with medium format, um, I mean, I love the quality and the sharpness and everything of the medium format, but it seemed like. I was the only one who appreciated it. <laughs> you know, I, my, my client, you know, it's sort of like if your clients aren't, you know, going gaga over it, um, then why are you kind of killing yourself? Yeah. Or you, get the, yeah, you get the call and it says, I can't open this file. <laughs> uh, don't send me a 300 megabyte file. I can't get a 300 megabyte file. Um, so, I mean, the biggest thing I would say is um, there's things I miss about film and there's a lot of things that I love about digital. I mean, I, I would say that when I go to a project, I walk a project and after I've walked that project, I've already created in my mind's eye 15 to 20 images that I want to produce over the next period of time, whether that be a day, two days, three days, whatever period of time. And then that next period of time is me uh, trying to be in the right place at the right time with the right weather conditions, all those type of things uh, to capture what I have in my mind's eye. Yeah. Uh, and I, I find that, that, uh, I'm able to do that better with digital than I ever could with. Um, that being said, I do think uh, I often make the analogy of film is very similar to the vinyl album that, you know, the audiophile wants to listen to the vinyl because of the warmth. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is a warmth to film that is missing in the cleanness and the purity of, of digital. Um, 
but you know, in this day and age with turnaround times and everything else, oh yeah, you know, there, there's film is obsolete. I mean, I, I sad to say, but you know, it's yeah, uh, yeah, I, I I agree. But let me just bring you back just a little bit. The the fact that you shot film and used a four by five. And you talk about walking through a, a building and being able to visualize those shots before you set them up and then getting yourself into position. To me, that's a discipline that comes with four by five with film shooting um, mm-hmm. is that you, you're, you, you know, the lens and you, you know where the camera needs to be based on your experience. And you're not walking around like a real estate photographer necessarily trying to frame up the right shot, <laughs> you know what the shot is. You right. just need to get the camera there and uh, and get things working so that that shot that you have in your eye, in your mind's eye, then you translate that into to a digital file. And I think that's a discipline that w- was more easily learned on a, in a film situation, and probably takes a little bit more effort to learn in a digital situation because you're not you're not burning film you know with all, with all these what ifs i i had a art director tell me on a photo shoot and this could be you know a good 10 plus years ago uh he said that he would always defer to a photographer who first learned on film mm than some of the younger photographers coming out who'd never shot film and only shot digital. And I think part of it is that discipline because I mean, as you know, in the film days, it was not only about that shot, but what did you have to do to get that end product that you wanted, which, which involved lighting, it involved gelling fluorescence, it involved (laughs) a a myriad of things that you had to be able to have mastery over if you expected your end product to be any good. And, And you did have to have that visualization of what you're trying to achieve or you wouldn't achieve it. Mm -hmm. And that was what the art director was saying is that, you know, he said these young photographers, they go take a picture and whatever comes on the back of that screen, they think that's the end product. (laughs) But, you know, you have to have an idea of what you want that end product to be. um, If you expect it to be, you know, of any quality. Um, I, I've been looking for this Ansel Adams quote for years. I know I heard it somewhere and I still can't find it anywhere, but, and I think it was Ansel Adams who said it, but he said, photography is not about reality, reality. It's about the perception of reality. And so I think what I'm trying to do when I go out and take my photographs is I want to, I don't want to say create a reality, I want to show reality in its best possible light. Um, I I want to, um, I I will say I've gotten a lot of feedback from way too many architects at too many architectural award things saying um, that project doesn't deserve an award. You made it look way better than it is. And I'm kind of like, well, isn't that what I'm paid to do? Uh, but, you know, but at the same time, you know, there there are a lot of ethical lines that I draw for myself that I don't cross. Mm-hmm. Like I won't. Um, I had somebody ask me the other day because the sky wasn't that great. Do you drop? Will you drop in a sky? And I'm like, no, I. I'm, I'm not going to, you know, I don't have a folder full of cool skies <laughs> to drop in if the sky, I mean, the sky was fine. It was just, it was a clear day without a whole lot of atmosphere. Mm-hmm. I drop in a bunch of fluffy clouds just because we didn't happen to have them. Um, you know, I, I, you know, we'll take out outlets, we'll clean yeah. things up, but, you know, intrinsically what I want 
my images to represent is, let's say, 98, 99% reality. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but having said that, though, is, don't you think there's something inherent when an architectural photographer like yourself does something that that you're creating a photograph and, and, you know, asking the viewer to then see that your way. <laughs> you know, I want you to see this building. I, 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 this is, this is how the building looks in my mind and in, in my mind's eye and in my eye or in my camera. And this is, you know, this is what I'm showing you as to what this building looks like. And so you are, you are kind of, at least I feel like we impose our own view of a building. Oh, absolutely. On other I mean, it. Yes. And, and I mean, you know, and there's been quite a few buildings, I'm sure you can say this of yourself, where you photographed it as well as a handful of others. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's, um, it's interesting to me to see you know, what I walked away from a building with mm -hmm. and um, what others have seen in that same, same building. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of times I take the greatest amount of joy in the images that let's say I have found that have not been the obvious. Right. You know, I think with most buildings, there are a handful of go-to shots. Sure. You could hire 10 photographers and they're going to walk away with those five shots and then some. Right. The, and then some. <laughs> you know, that, that is really the interesting thing is, you know, what are the other shots that they are, are seeing? And... Um, and it's something that you can't train. It's something that only comes from experience and shooting and shooting and shooting and developing your your own eye and you know finding those things. Um, I think you're a better photographer now than you were, say, five years ago or um, or a year ago. I hope so. I hope so. Um, I I think I, I'm mentioned to you that um, I, I kind of formed a long distance friendship with Fernando Gaera, who I still admire beyond belief for his architectural photography. And uh, I, I think uh, COVID and, and his and my conversations with one another, uh, that I think we both were working so hard pre-COVID mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, it, it, he made the analogy of feeling like a factory worker, you know, and I, hear the, I, I mean, I think that's the most interesting thing is, and, and this goes back even to me working in New York City, is like you have this great admiration for people like Avedon or Maple Tharp or Arnold Newman or whomever. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, and then you meet them and you work with them and you realize, you know, they're not gods, they're human beings, you know, we're all just human. And uh, when Fernando and I met and had dinner and things like that, uh, you know, here's this photographer who I think does this phenomenal work, but when we were sitting down having dinner, I mean, we have all the same struggles. <laughs> all the same headaches, uh, whether it be, you know, uh, client headaches, travel headaches, uh, you know, financial headaches, um, you know, we all deal with the same things, you know, no, it, it, you always think the grass is greener on the other <laughs> side, but it isn't always <laughs> that green. And um, so, I mean, I do think COVID gave a little bit of a breather yeah. and now coming back there's an appreciation for being able to do what we are so fortunate to be able to do and uh, and and uh, you know 
Let, let me put it this way. Um, you say, is my work any better? I would say a few years ago, I hated everything I did. <laughs> I mean, I hated it all. Um, it typically took three to five years of distance from a photo shoot for me to be able to say, you know, that wasn't half bad. Now, maybe that timeline, you know, there, there, there are times where I'm kind of like, that was, that was pretty good. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's sort of like I, I perpetually want to be my worst critic, you know. That's or, not a bad thing. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't ever want to become complacent. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, when you, uh, you know, you you've talked about a, a few uh, other architectural photographers historically. Are there, are there a, a handful of photographers whose work um, from the past that you admire? Um, any in particular that stand out to you historically? Um, well, I mean, you you have to give credit to Ezra Stoller. I yeah. mean, no question. I mean, that's. Um, you know, I, uh, I'm not a, a huge fan of Julius Schulman, um, but I mean, there are certain things of Julius Schulman that I, I do really admire. In fact, I have a Julius Schulman quote in my signature, which is, you know, uh, I, I'm trying to remember exactly what the quote is, but uh, essentially our photographs allow thousands upon thousands and now with the internet maybe even millions of people sure. that they may not ever be able to see in person um so i do think that is critical uh nick merrick uh mm -hmm. was uh, i mean nick i took one of nick's workshops now i don't know 15 years maybe more ago uh, at the Santa Fe Photographic Santa Fe, yeah. And uh, Nick and I became friends and we still communicate. Uh, I mean, Nick does, has done, continues to do beautiful work. Yeah. Um, Fernando, I, like I said, I mean, he's not past, he's present. Mm -hmm. uh, I just every day you know but th then again i'm I, i'm texting with him about how we're having crappy weather and <laughs> how we got uh, uh all this gray sky from all the smoke from the wildfires and stuff like that and then he sends me pictures from spain or portugal that he's got a crystal blue sky and i'm just like <laughs> Thank you very little. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I will also say that I find um, as much of my time when I go to the bookstore anymore, um, I, I don't want to say that the photo book era has passed. I, I find, though, far fewer books that I'm interested in purchasing, yeah. uh, probably pur purchasing more architecture books. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah that, that, that market seems to have tapered off pretty dramatically. And um, I guess it's just, you know, the advent of the internet that kind of quieted things down and people buying books that way, people buying books in general, I suppose, but that's interesting. Um, Ansel Adams said that a good photograph is knowing where to stand. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that is one of the key points about successful architectural photographers is that as I look at your work, you know, a, a move to the right or the left or in elevation up or down would change the photograph you've made pretty dramatically that, that you're at where you are with that photograph for a specific reason uh, in, in composing it that way. And, you know, that everything was deliberate there. And I, I think that's something that may be 
you know, and somebody outside the industry doesn't really quite understand that there's just that precision in in where, where you are and how you frame that and the focal length of the lens that you use, things like that. Um, equipment wise, are, are, are you a heavy equipment person? Do you carry a lot of gear or are you kind of spare? I would say I'm more on the spare side. Okay. Uh, you know, um, we don't carry, carry a ton of equipment, but I mean, we, we carry our, our share. I mean, I do an assistant. I've, I've had a full-time assistant for years now, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, and it's, it's, it's a really good thing. You, you asked this earlier, uh, there's myself, there's my associate, Lauren Davis. Um, there's my assistant. Um, my old assistant um, is still working with us. And I mean, we, we dropped his hours to 10 hours a week. And uh, he's a stay at home dad and mm. he back of the house kind of stuff. And then I have a retoucher who's not in house, but out of house. Okay. So, in, you know, in, intrinsically, and then I have a rep in Chicago who handles my commercial work. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, I suppose under my umbrella, there's about six of us. Okay. Good wow. to know. I, I think that's going to be surprising for some people who are working solo. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, you know, I, I honestly don't know um, how people do, uh, you know, hire freelancers, you know, when they, like, I know a lot of people um, who hire freelancers every place they go. And um, I, I know that my process, having somebody who knows me, knows how I work and things is integral. I mean, it, it, going back to, and I don't want to dwell on this, but you know, when Fernando and I got together, his process is entirely different. <laughs> um, and it's kind of funny. I mean, I, 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 I love to see how he works and I think he watching how I work is, uh, he'd go, he'd probably be pulling out his hair. He, he'd lose his mind. <laughs> But, you know, he travels, he does not work with an assistant and he travels the world by himself, hmm. which, um, which, you know, I, I think is great. I also think it's gotta be terribly lonely. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, um, I, I just, I can't imagine that life. I mean, you know, to some people that might be intriguing. I'm sure Iwan Bond's life is <laughs> boring into his work. Uh, you know, I'm sure all those people are sort of uh, on a plane perpetually. In fact, I, I for, for a while there, I was wondering how Iwan Bond does it with his internal time clock, because, you know, he'd be in, you know, for a week and then he'd be in South Africa the next week and then he'd be in Los Angeles the following week. And then uh, I, I'm like, how does your body or, or do you even have a time clock <laughs> or, or how do you um, how, how do you do what you do? You know, <laughs> yeah, that's rough. I mean, the, the physical part of of doing that aspect of what we do if if we reach that kind of threshold is, is interesting <laughs> yeah it, it's it's pretty demanding you know even just um you know those of us that work for you know mostly domestically um it, it can be pretty grueling at times um and it, it, if i have a week where i have to shoot every day um i'm kind of a wreck you know, when the weekend comes. <laughs> so. Well, I, I know starting September, you go from September to November, September, October to mid-November right now, Monday through Friday, I'll be shooting every day, oh. every single day. Um, I, and, and if I could find more days in the week, I'd probably 
could or would. Um, but it, it is interesting. We have a shoot coming up in a couple of weeks in London, um, which is quite frankly an anomaly. Um, we've done all of the American Express lounges across. Mm, okay. Um, or American Express from when they started opening lounges. I mean, we didn't, they had somebody else photograph their first lounge, which it wasn't a good fit. And we photographed the second lounge and we've done every lounge since from Seattle to New York, to Miami, to Houston, to you, you name it. If you've seen American Express lounge, we photographed it. And they have this lounge opening in Heathrow that uh, two years ago, pre-COVID, they said, oh, we're going to have this lounge opening in Heathrow and we want you to shoot it. And we were like, oh, this will be great. You know, we'll, and it was <laughs> summertime and we thought, oh, we'll go over to Heathrow, maybe bring my wife along. We'll stay a few extra days, do some traveling. And now it is most definitively a work trip, <laughs> you know. Not leaving the airport. <laughs> it's going to be, you know, uh, fly over on Tuesday, arrive on Wednesday, shoot Thursday, Friday. And the only reason why we're flying back on Sunday and not Saturday is the tickets are $1,000 cheaper on Sunday than they are on Saturday. <laughs> so it's cheaper for us to stay an extra day than it is yep. to return. But, you know, we're, we're scheduling all of our... You have to take a COVID test 36 hours before you leave. You've got to take a COVID test on day two. You've got to take a COVID test the day before you return. Um, it, it's just understanding um, the hoops we have to jump through is onerous in and of itself. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, uh, I'm, I'm very content. Um, you know, as much as I see these wonderful things being built in places like uh, the UAE and places yeah. like China, um, I'm pretty content being a domestic architectural photographer, you know. I can agree with that. <laughs> yeah, the logistics are but, a little yeah. bit dissuading. <laughs> the, the, the best piece of advice I can give to anyone, architectural photographer or not, is, is advice from my mother, which was be very careful what you wish for because you just might get it. <laughs> Good advice, yeah. It is, it is very wise advice. I will tell you, I, as far as clients, there are clients who I wanted to do work for and gotten to do work for and hope I never have to do work <laughs> Uh, there are things like this London trip, which I'm, I'm happy I'm having the opportunity to do, but it is a far cry from what I imagined it to be originally. And uh, I think that is very true in life of lots and lots of things. <laughs> I, I quite agree. Um, as, as we wrap up here, Brad, you know, I thank you for all the information you've given us. It, this has been really insightful to me, and I know it will be to the viewers that, that see this once we uh, post this. But a, a, advice to advice to new people coming into the industry. Um, is there anything that you think would be important that they know that they probably don't know now uh, for somebody entering the architectural photography industry? Um. And, and and this is this sounds funny. This and I don't mean this in any way, shape, or form to dissuade people. And I, I remember somebody who is a photographer out there today who came to me early on, and I, I said these type of things to her, and um, she thought I was just like being mean or being <laughs> tough. And and now she's come back and sort of said, you know. I really appreciate what you said to me uh, because it's all true. And, you know, I say to my architectural photography students, whether they intend to do architectural photography or just photography alone, that if you don't wake up in the morning and, and feel like I have to do this, 
Mm-hmm. I absolutely, I have to do this. This is for my soul. I have to do this. And therefore, I will beg, borrow, steal, do whatever I've got to do to be able to have this be my profession. Don't do it. <laughs> um, and, and that is not to dissuade people. Um, I have seen so many photographers go by the wayside over my years. Mm -hmm. Um, It is not an easy profession. Um, It's actually not a a very glamorous profession. People think it's glamorous. Oh yeah. (laughs) Uh, It is is hard work. Um, You know, there are lots of times I'm up at, 4 a.m. to be on location by 5.30, 6 a.m. to do a dawn shot and then put in 14, 15 hours because I'm working all day through dusk. Uh, There have been shoots that I have been on um, where we started at 11 a.m. on Thursday and finished at 10 a.m. Friday and work for 23 hours straight. Yeah. Um, And, um, and I will tell you, um, at hour 22 out of those 23, um, I was still enjoying the process. (laughs) I'm not saying I wasn't tired. I'm, but I was still enjoying the process. I was still happy. I was there. I wasn't like, when is this going to be over? I knew it was (laughs) over. But, but I, I mean, there is never a day, there's never a day that I don't enjoy what I'm doing and enjoy all aspects of the business. I don't mind marketing. I don't mind bookkeeping. I don't mind all the other things I have to do if it means that I'm going to get to be behind a camera some of the time. And um, if that's not where your heart is, um, you're just going to have a hard time making it. And, And again, not trying to be harsh, not trying to be difficult, just trying to be real. I mean, that's, I mean, that's the long and the short of it. Yeah. Uh, I quite agree. <laughs> and, and, and I mean, and, and the best advice I can give anybody is to shoot. Um, you know, you asked about, you know, do I like my work? And, um, you know, it, it's, I, I would, God, I hope my work has gotten better over the years, but I, I was with an architect friend of mine, yesterday and she said you know it's been really wonderful to watch your career evolve and that you know kind of I mean in a roundabout way she sort of said you know at the very beginning your work was kind of and (laughs) and now you know I feel like you're doing some good work for some good people and 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 it really has you know uh, you've evolved and and are doing some good things. And, and that, that feels good. I mean, it, it's hard to know where you are on the continuum <laughs> while you're on the continuum, you know? Um, yes. I mean, and, and I would say my hope is uh, as a photographer that when, whenever the time comes that I do leave this world, you know, that um, I've been able to promote the profession, and why I say the profession, um, the profession of architectural photography, but also the profession of architecture. Um, to me, um, I feel a great indebtedness to the history that my father and grandfather began. And that if I can help architects get some recognition and notoriety for their work or help them earn uh, new projects uh, with my photography being in their portfolio, then you know that's that's a testament to to my efforts. I, I've said so many times, um, I live vicariously through my clients. 
that if they win awards, if they uh, get new clients and my photography has played a small role in that happening, then I've done my job. Yeah. Um, it, it's not, it's not about me. It's about them. Mm -hmm. uh, that's important. You know? Yeah. I, I, I appreciate that. It, um, it's what you do is such an integral part of the success of your clients. And uh, that's very evident. And you've got some uh, uh, very high profile clients who, whose work, uh, I think in the, in the public eye is represented by the photographs that you take. When somebody thinks of one of those projects from one of those companies, it's the, it's your photograph that they're seeing in their mind's eye. Um, and, and that's, that's a huge testament to your skills and talent and uh, you should be very proud of that. Brad, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. You've offered some amazing insights and uh, understanding about your work and in the industry in general, and also about photography in general, the, the profession of photography, which remains a mystery to most of the world. So I, I appreciate that. I've been very generous and thank you again for, for doing this. This has been another episode of A Photographer's Life. If you've enjoyed this program, please let us know by liking this episode and subscribing to this channel. A Photographer's Life is brought to you by the Association of Independent Architectural Photographers. This episode is copyrighted, and may not be used in full or in part, without the written permission of the AIAP. Please join us again soon for another inside look at the world of professional architectural photography.